The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Kuypers, president of the West Slope chapter of Charter Unlimited here in Missoula. Um, thanks for uh, joining us today, our, our West Slope chapter members, members around Montana, and anybody else who uh, found out about this is welcome to join in and glad to have you here. Um, we're gonna get right to the program, but uh, first, just a couple announcements. For our next meeting, we'll, we'll be online and we'll be featuring, featuring Callie Gallup, January 13. Of course, Kelly is the streamer master. He's spoken to our club a couple times and uh, um, he's gonna be great. I, I understand he did a fantastic presentation for backcountry hunters and anglers, and we're gonna try to mirror that. And then in February, February 10, Skip Morris, who was a very innovative uh, fly tire author, um, teacher, uh, haven't decided exactly what topic, but there's going to be some fly tying and some technique in there, and that's on February 10. And then our auction is going to end on February 27, and it'll probably run five or six days before that. The only other announcement is uh, if you go to our Facebook page, just West Slope Chapter Chart Unlimited, you'll find uh, a couple of posts down. Um, a Euro nymphing sweepstakes or raffle where you can buy tickets. And uh, we've got a great package, an Orvis um, Euro rod nymphing uh, setup, rod, reel, line, leader, flies, all of that. And plus it comes with a day's instruction from uh, Blackfoot River Outfitters. So that's gonna be, uh, it's a great raffle, about a $2,000 value and you can buy tickets there and I encourage you to do so because it's going to be a, a challenging year raising money um, uh, just given not a live auction and so forth so anything you can do to support the chapter would be fantastic well I'm going to introduce our guest first but first um, I've got uh, I just got to talk about my own steel heading experience because I, I think many of you might know of the famous uh, John Stein, uh, a Steinbeck quote about Montana. He says, I love Montana. For other states, I have admiration, recognition, and even some affection. But with Montana, it's love. And I'll tell you, I like a lot of fish, but man, steelhead. I love steelhead. You can look a steelhead in the eye and it looks back at you. I, I just love steelhead. My own story is I uh, moved to Pullman, Washington to go to WSU for graduate school in 74. I'd never been fly fishing before. I started fly fishing in 75 for trout uh, and then uh, moved to steelhead in 76. And I was cursed with hooking a steelhead on the Snake River on my first day fishing solo. And uh, that's where the passion and the disease really, really took off. Um, unfortunately, I fished for two more years without hooking a fish. And then I brooded for a whole winter about why, and I kind of figured it out. I wish um, our speaker's father, Bill McMillan, had, um, had published this book before before I went through my trials because in it, uh, which is dry line steelhead and other subjects, it really unlocks a lot of the secrets that maybe most of us know from fishing with other people. But when I was there on the Clearwater and the Snake and the Grand Ronde, I was, re I mean, the good news was I was pretty much the only guy fishing there. There were a few other people, but boy, were they tight-lipped and they weren't telling me anything. So I, I learned kind of the, just the, you know, just by doing it, by making mistakes and finally putting it together. And a couple of things that worked for me was I figured out that a sinking line is not the way to go. And of course that's, you know, uh, something that everybody takes for granted now that a floating line is just so much more effective except for you know winter run fish or when the water gets cold 
but that gave me line control. And then I just insisted that I turned the leader over completely every time. And anyway, a bunch of other stuff. And by God, I started catching fish. And uh, the flies I used, and I still use today, are pretty much these two here, a marabou fall favorite, which is just a piece of, I mean, it's just a little bit of feather and a silver body and a clump of marabou with a little bit of polar bear or, or deer hair, or a red uh, as an under underwing. Uh, it just works like crazy. And this is a size uh, eight here, and I mostly fish sixes and eight. And now the, the other fly is my dark fly, which is a, a black bear. And that's just really simple. It's got a, a, a black bear wing, golden pheasant, pheasant tippet tail, a black wool body, silver rib, and a black hackle, hackle. And I've just caught hundreds of steelhead on these flies because they're the two that I fish all the time. And then this last fly, is called Winter's Hope. And I've carried it in my box since sometime probably 1978 or 79. And it's a fly that our speaker, speaker's father, Bill McMillan, uh, uh, pioneered back in the day. I can't say I've ever caught a fish on it, but I haven't fished it very much either. It's it's a it's a winter run fish, you know, with a heavy hook and stuff like that. And I just never got into that until a few years ago. So Anyway, that's um, that's kind of uh, you know my steelhead story, and and one of the reasons I'm so excited to um, uh, to welcome John McMillan, uh, you know, to give this presentation. Uh, you know, you know, John was uh, I was just getting started steelhead fishing when John was born, or when he was a toddler or a grade schooler or something like that. But he comes uh, into this fishing, fishing through his upbringing and, and his own passion uh, for the fish and the environment. And that is shown in the work he does as uh, TU's Wild Steelhead Initiative Science Director. John lives on the Olympic Peninsula um, outside of Port Angeles, not too far from Forks, where there's all kinds of uh, uh, streams come together and uh, just incredible place i was i started fishing there just a few years ago maybe five years ago and uh my god i caught the biggest steel that i've ever caught in my life a true 40 incher on the boga shell what a what a fish and that you'll you can see that photo of that uh on our website so anyway um so john's going to share with us um you know stuff about steelhead life history steelhead environment and um, I think there'll be a bit of a love story there too with steelhead and a little bit of techniques. So John, turning it over to you. Oh, just one more thing. The, the presentation is in kind of in, in three sections. There's sort of the you know steelhead background, um, and then there's gonna be discussion about the Elwa Dam that was taken out, which is a huge success, and then the fishing. And at the end of each of those sections, uh, sections we'll have time for some questions and just uh, use your, um, uh, on the right hand side of your screen there, you should have some prompts and just uh, answer a question and our moderator, uh, Scott Melanchuk, uh will uh, field those to John. And and that brings me something that I forgot. And uh, thanks to Scott for uh, hosting this on his company's um, GoToMeeting account so we could have more people uh, and it would work fine. So thanks Scott. and. John, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, much Mark. And um, yeah, really happy to present to um, the chapter tonight. And thank you to everyone who's who's taken some time out of their evening to, to do a Zoom talk. And so today uh, I'm gonna talk about really, I think three things like Mark mentioned. First, I'm gonna talk about the value of diversity in steelhead. And uh, because steelhead, as we're going to see in here, are a very diverse species of salmonid. I'm also going to give you an update on how uh, steelhead are doing in the Elwha River. And then lastly, I'm going to I'm going to shift to a, a another short presentation where I where I talk about some of the you know the five or six commandments that I think about when I'm fly fishing for steelhead, and we can try and um, dive into tactics and techniques a little bit. So, without further ado. Um, 
you know, I think as Mark said, I, I basically was raised on the banks of the Washougal River, which is in southwest Washington. Um, and my dad was a fly fisherman. My grandfather uh, was a steelheader. He started out gear fishing, but eventually became a fly fisherman. And my great grandfather um, also lived in lived in Oregon there, and, and he was a fisherman. So this has been in my family for a really long time. And um, you know, you can see that's a picture of me on the upper left hand side with my dad holding me. And I think you know that's on the Deschutes River in Oregon, one of the first places I learned how to fly fish. Um, and the story behind this fish in the picture is this is the first steelhead that I actually landed on my own and got to set the hook on. So uh, what happened, I think, like Mark was mentioning, um, I was born in 1971 and this was 1976 and I was five years old and was supposed to go to show up uh, on Monday morning for preschool. And I didn't want to go to preschool. I wanted to stay uh, at home with my dad and go fishing and, and stay on the river. And so my dad said, we'll take you for a week long trip and we'll try and get your first steelhead on the fly. And so we went up and fished a couple of rivers, didn't do any good. And on the way home, we stopped at one of the favorite runs on the Washougal. And I was too small to wade out, but my dad would cast a line. Then he held me in his arms and put the rod there. And I eventually set the hook on this big steelhead and uh, was really excited. I felt that was pretty cool. And I showed up the preschool the next day and, and I was stunned that other kids didn't know about steelhead. Like none of the other children there had heard about steelhead. So it was a disappointing beginning to my academic career, uh, but fortunately, we've also uh, been able to follow through with that because I do love steelhead. They're my favorite fish. It's not the, um, I'm not just a scientist because I want to, because I'm curious about science. I'm into science because I love animals and steelhead are one of the creatures that I really love. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the biology of diversity. Can, I can hear somebody's phone in the background. Could they mute? Um, so the first, the first thing I want to do is, is talk a little bit about how steelhead are different than salmon. And what I mean by that is steelhead are part of the Pacific salmon family. Um, but you know, there's also some very important differences between steelhead and salmon. So we want to talk about those differences, specifically kind of the role that diversity plays in distinguishing those two species. And we want to talk about how steelhead maintain this diversity, because I think when we talk about a diverse species, we're not always certain about the biology underpinning that diversity. And then, of course, we're going to talk Elwha steelhead. So the first question is, you know, how and why are steelhead different than salmon? And uh, I don't just love to fish uh, for steelhead. I also spend a tremendous amount of time snorkeling underwater. I've snorkeled about 2,000 miles in my life, and as part of that, I just also love to take underwater photos and videography of steelhead. So, man, I am probably addicted to these fish too much. Um, so what we're gonna do here is kind of walk through an example of um, different population sizes in a watershed that has all five species of Pacific salmon, including the steelhead, uh, or, for the five species of Pacific salmon and then including steelhead. And so what we have here on the bottom, down here as you can see that the, uh, the graph runs from 1990 all the way to about 2014. And on the very right hand axis that goes up vertically, you can see thousands of fish. And so this is pink salmon. I had to put pink salmon on an axis all the way to the right. So we're gonna have two Y axes, but that axis to the right is the number of pink salmon that return to the Skagit River each year from 1990, I think it's actually 2012. So sorry about saying 2014. And what you see is that pink salmon runs can be really abundant, like in these big peaks, but then they can also be followed up by really big troughs. And so there's a lot of variation in annual run size from year to year for pink salmon. And, and let's be I should be clear, it's every other year, these are alternating pinks, like most pink salmon. So you get a run one year and then you don't get another run for two years later. So the point though, is you're seeing pink salmon go from run sizes that are um, as, you know, beneath 200,000 all the way up to um, a couple million fish. So that's a lot of variation in run size. So we're gonna put all these other species over here on the other axes, and this is chum. Uh, and again, you know, chum are not quite as variable as pink salmon, uh, but they're pretty close, right? The peak run was about 400,000 fish, but in recent years, they've had run sizes that are right around 10,000. So that's a lot of variation 
going from 400,000 in a peak year down to 10,000 in a bad year. Um, here we also have Chinook and coho salmon. So you can see that, again, coho, um, not as variable as chum salmon, but they're more variable than Chinook. And then we have steelhead, which are kind of flatlined down there, right? They, uh, they're never as abundant as, as any of these other species of salmon, at least very rarely. Some years they, they match the abundance of Chinook. Uh, but what we see is that there's not a lot of annual variation relative uh, to the other salmon species. And so the question is, is there a way that we can perhaps explain um, why steelhead have less variation in abundance from year to year? Why aren't they going from 1 million one year to 3,000 fish the next like pink? And so one of the likely explanations is life history diversity. And so what we're gonna do here is kind of walk through a very basic description in this table. So we have steelhead, then we have freshwater life histories, and there's a four there. And that means there's four life histories in freshwater for steelhead in the Skagit River. What I mean by that is there's one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, and four-year-old smolts in the Skagit River. And then we have four ocean life histories, which means that there are one salt, two salt, three salt, and four salt steelhead in the Columbia. And we have a two for run timing because the Skagit supports both summer and winter steelhead. And so basically you multiply those together and you get a potential combination of 32 different life histories a steelhead could display in the Skagit. And that's a bare minimum because we're also not including the potential for half pounder steelhead. We're not including the potential for a few five-year-old smolts and we're not including repeat spawners. So there are likely far more life histories, but this is just the basic raw minimum. And then what we see is we kind of do this for all the other species, right? We go through and add them all up. And of course, what we see is that, look, it really declines, right? Steelhead are very different from these other species of salmon, especially chum and pink. And uh, which basically kind of have, you know, one or two life histories that they rely on consistently. And so uh, the question then is, is there a relationship between the life histories and what we call the coefficient of variation on the bottom? And so what you'll see is that the smaller the coefficient of variation, you know, 20%, the less variable, uh, the less variation there is in run size, and the higher coefficient of variation over here on the right, 80%, the more variation there is in run size. You've got numbers of life history on the y-axis, and what we see is that there's a really strong relationship <clears throat> between the number of life histories and the extent of annual variation. And my analogy for this is, this is really like, um, you know, it's like, a, it's like a, a portfolio in the market. It's kind of like a retirement account. When you go to invest in the market, I always liken uh, pink and chum salmon are kind of like Bitcoin, you know, or, or a stock that varies quite a bit because one day they can be really strong and the next day they can be really bad. And that's because they only have one or two life histories. So if one really bad event happens at any point in a pink salmon's life there are no other life histories to help it boost its abundance so it tends to swing up and down pretty dramatically steelhead on the other hand are, are kind of what we refer to in in ecology as uh, bet hedgers and and they're not technically a bet hedger but i like to use the term because i think biologically that's kind of uh, an easier way to describe it to folks so basically steelhead are not putting all their eggs in one basket right they have one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old smolts. They have lots of different ocean ages. And because they have all of these different life histories, it helps ensure that they're more resilient from year to year in abundance compared to other species. And that's because those different life histories that if any one bad event happens to one of them, there's still like 31 or 30 other life histories to help make up for that. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about steelhead, what we see relative to all these other fish. So steelhead are the most diverse of any salmonid. They display more life histories than any other fish. It's 32 to 38 life histories, <clears throat> depending on the population. But if you start to include half pounders, you can get up to 42 life histories in a place like the Klamath River. Um, and what we know is that steelhead display a remarkable array of both age at smolting and age in the ocean. Most steelhead smolts are one to three years of age, but as you get into Alaska, you start to see uh, more four-year-olds. 
And there are occasional five, six, and there's even been one seven-year-old smolt recorded. Um, and of course, uh, the fish may spend, uh, you know, a month or two in the ocean, like a half pounder or a coastal cutthroat, and then return at a really small size. On the other hand, some steelhead will spend five consecutive years in the ocean, and those are the monsters that return in that 40-inch size class that Mark talked about, the really big fish. And this results in this kind of striking variation in age and size, and that's kind of the diversity that we're talking about in steelhead. And, and so what I like to do is, if I want to try and recover uh, a species of fish, what I have to do in a place like the lower 48 is I need kind of a model for what steelhead might look like in a place where they haven't been touched by hatcheries or over harvest or habitat degradation or hydropower. And one place we can do that is uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. And that's where a lot of the data has come from that spurred my interest uh, in understanding more about steelhead life histories. And so this table here is gonna illustrate to you the different life histories. And in many cases, most cases actually, when you have steelhead, all of these life histories coexist in one single population. And the population is interbreeding. So the, you know, in one hand, they have a fully anadromous life history. Um, and that's kind of the normal steelhead we think about, right? You know, they go out to the ocean for a few years. They tend to mature at age five to six after uh, a couple of years in the ocean. And they return on average about 30 inches in length or, or 10 pounds. And what's interesting in Russia, and like a lot of folks see in the interior of Colombia, is that most of those fully anadromous large fish are um, female. In fact, the populations can be skewed as much as 80% female, depending on the population. Now, we also have what we call estuarine steelhead in those Russian rivers. And these are fish that basically behave like coastal cutthroat. They go out to the estuary for a couple of months, and then they return at a pretty small size, right? And the reason they're smaller is because they only spent a month or two in the ocean. And those smaller fish, again, are mostly male. And then we have a river estuarine form, and that is different. That is a fish that one year stays in fresh water as a rainbow trout, and then the next year it goes out to the estuary, and then it repeats that pattern over the course of its life. One year going to the estuary, one year alternating staying in fresh water. Again, mostly, most of those fish are almost all, in some cases, all of them that have been sampled are male. And then you've got this resident rainbow trout component. You know, again, they never go to the ocean. Uh, they're about the same size as those estuarine fish, and uh, they tend to be mostly, if not all, male. And so the question is, why are the really large fish mostly female, and why are the really much smaller fish mostly or all male? And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is, uh, the measure of fitness in many animals is how large you get in life, but it's not always the case. So what we see in salmon is that generally the larger you are, the more reproductively successful you are, but this is a much stronger influence in females. And it's more important to females because females are carrying as the, the larger their body size get, the more eggs they carry. So there's a relationship there between size and egg number or egg size. And so larger females, it behooves them to try and grow to as large a size as possible because you're going to have a higher fecundity. You're going to have more eggs. And because there's a high mortality from the egg to fry stage in, in most Pacific salmonids, those females that are larger basically have more lottery tickets in the evolutionary game that their juveniles are gonna to play to try and survive to adulthood. On the other hand, as we're gonna see in the videos, males can both be really big because the largest individuals are typically male, but the very smallest individuals are typically male. And that's because there's different behaviors that these males have evolved. And so what, we're, what I'm interested in where I live on the Olympic Peninsula is basically, are we seeing a similar pattern to what we see in Russia? And if so, can I document the behavior that helps explain or uh, promulgate this type of um, life history diversity in steelhead? So I fish a lot and I lived in Forks for about 10 or 11 years. And during that time I was fishing about 350 days a year. So you live on a river and fish it that much. I basically 
took my own data. So I took about um, the size and girth and weights off about 400 steelhead over a, over about a seven year period. And this is for the Quillute River watershed. And so this is just a histogram that shows you the length of winter steelhead, wild winter steelhead uh, females that I caught during my catch. And what you see is there's a, you know, there's a bell curve, um, a slightly skewed distribution, but somewhat normal. But you again see kind of what I would see in the Russian data, which is most of the fish are too salt. They're in that range between 27 to 31 inches or 8 to 10 pounds, kind of the normal size. Um, and there's really very few small females below 20 inches that I've ever encountered. On the other hand, uh, again, kind of as we see in Russia, the very largest individuals are male. And then we have this kind of, um, you know, less common but still important component where we have smaller anadromous males that are anywhere from 14 to 20 inches in length. So we can see here that the pattern that we see in these relatively intact, untouched populations, we're seeing a very similar pattern where I live. And, and to me, that's just kind of a good sign. So what I want to do today is kind of walk you through all of these different phenotypes, because that's what we're talking about, is that the genotype is your genetic potential to express um, whatever the genes regulate. Your phenotype is kind of what is actually expressed in real life. And so um, in the Quileute River, as I was mentioning, the largest individuals are male. And that is because really large dominant males tend to have really high reproductive success. And so here's a male that was a, a, a four salt fish, 42 inches in length, probably, you know, high 20s, low 30 pounds. And for me, I like to put this in context of human beings. And so uh, any of you who have ever watched Game of Thrones, which is a TV show that uh, my wife introduced me to, I was skeptical, and then I became like addicted to it. And I thought Game of Thrones is a lot like survival in the fish world. It's not very easy. And Game of Thrones had this guy who was called the Mountain. He was 6'9", 420 pounds. And just imagine this, if the Mountain was standing between the average male and all of the women in the universe, or if he was standing between a woman and all of the men in the universe, that it would be really hard for any individual kind of normal sized individual to take on the mountain through violence and get through him to find a mate. So he's a really big, he's a really big guy. And that's very helpful. Of course, we also have slightly smaller males. This is a three salt uh, from the Quileute system. And I kind of like to think of the three salts like Arnold Schwarzenegger. They're still pretty big, uh, but you know, they would still probably get their butt kicked and end up dead by the mountain. And then of course we have these normal, uh, normal two salt males in the Quileute river system. And they're basically the equivalent to me. I'm like five, 10 and a half, about 205 pounds. And I kind of like to equate them to Charlie, Charlie Sheen, right? He's the wild thing. Uh, it talks about drinking tiger blood. He's crazy. He's five, 10, a buck 80. I think Charlie Sheen is definitely some guy who would give the mountain a run for his money. Uh, and, but that's kind of what it looks like when you compare them side by side. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Charlie Sheen is not really a fair fight. But then we also have these small males that I talked about. And these are like these estuarine offshore, nearshore fish. They kind of do what a cutthroat does. And um, they're about 16 inches. I like to think of Cheers, a favorite show growing up, or Twins, the movie. They're kind of like my Danny DeVito's, uh, five foot, 140 pounds. And that's what Danny looks like when he's compared to Arnold. And I just remind people this isn't meant to, you know, make fun of anybody who's, who's large or short. I mean, I've got my my own issues, I'm no perfect specimen. The point here is that one female can give rise to all of this different diversity in male sizes. And that's a really important factor that I don't think a lot of folks talk about. But of course, not all of the micas go to the ocean. Steelhead produce offspring, and some of those offspring will never go out to the ocean. Rather, they will remain in freshwater and mature as a rainbow trout. I did my graduate work uh, in the John Day River Basin in Oregon. And this is just one example of an age one plus male. So this fish is about 19 months old. It's about five and a half inches in length. And what you see over here inside the fish, those big white strips and sacs, those are sperm sacs. So this fish in late September is fully mature uh, or almost fully mature, even though it won't spawn until spring. And I'll take a little tangent. The reason we think that fish was matured that early in September, even though it won't spawn until April, 
is that we caught it at about 5,000 feet elevation. The creek that it will inhabit and overwinter in is going to be frozen over. And so it's going to be so cold that the fish is kind of going to go into a state of torpor and, um, you know, it'll be alive. It's awake. It might even consume a tad bit of food, but it's going to rely on its fat stores. And then when the ice melts and runoff starts, the females are going to be ready to spawn. So the male would not have any time to go through physiological development during the ice out. So the theory is uh, that some of these males are maturing really early. Um, and then we'll overwinter under ice. But the most important thing here, again, is just that we've got these very small males, and I like to call them Peter Dinklage's. Uh, again, in Game of Thrones, if you watched it, uh, the mountain died and Peter Dinklage lives. Like, the important thing here is that outwardly, we almost universally think of large salmon as being more important. We often think of large elk as being more important, or large deer as more important to their respective populations of animals. What I want to illustrate to you today is that is necess not necessarily always the case. So what we're going to do here now is I'm going to use a couple videos. And this is uh, an example of how these different sized males go about establishing a hierarchy. And so the very largest males, this is the equivalent of, you know, an Arnold fighting uh, an Arnold Schwarzenegger fighting the mountain. One fish is about 18 pounds, the other about 16. And these fish fought like this for uh, almost two days straight. They kept going at it. And you can see other fish swimming around them. And there was a large female that they were fighting over. And the male that won this fight uh, eventually got to go up alongside that female. And that's the one that she selected. So, and that's pretty common the largest female is often waiting for the biggest males to fight. And then when that happens, uh, she will allow the winner, if, if she accepts him, they will begin to mate. So, but it, these are what we call guards. Uh, they try and basically guard access to females by being remarkably violent, right? Their whole gig is to chase everybody else away. And if you're large, that's probably the best tactic. Um, however, uh, and, th and this is going to kind of be an example of what a, uh, females also have a choice. And so here's a female who is trying to bite another male that comes into the spawning pair. And so, again, sometimes um, the female just simply doesn't want these smaller males, males. And I just want to illustrate that it's not just always males keeping each other away from the female, that once the choice is made and the female selects her mate, she will actively chase away other males too, as she's doing here. Um, now, fortunately, if, the, if, the, if all of nature was dependent only on large males, most of us that are on this Zoom call probably wouldn't be here. So we're pretty lucky that there are a bunch of ways that nature's evolved for smaller, non-dominant males to actually find mates and reproduce. And so what we see here is a picture. There's a, a, a female steelhead, the bright one up here with a male steelhead by her. And then down behind that snorkel, uh, down behind the oval is a sneaker male rainbow trout. And so this is actually about a 15 inch rainbow trout uh, that's holding. And he's holding what we call a satellite position. And these are um, affectionately referred to, as you can see, sneakers. And we call them uh, satellite males because they often orbit around the pair and uh, they're kind of harassing the male, and, um, but there is a moment, right? The moment at which the female uh, dips into the red to release her eggs, and the large male does so to release his sperm, they're incapacitated. And for those moments they're incapacitated, these smaller males will sneak both underneath, if they're small enough, underneath the steelhead, or alongside the pair, and they will fertilize too. And we know that this can be a remarkably successful tactic. So what I'm going to show you now in this video is an example of a very small uh, Peter Dinklage coming in. The Peter Dinklage is going to come in over here from the left, and you're going to see this little rainbow trout dive in under the spawning pair, right? So you see the little male, there he goes, under the pair, and then you also see other satellite steelheads come in from the other side. So I think we have one, two, three, four, we have like five males fertilizing one female. 
And at the very end, you'll see a few other uh, smaller uh, little steelhead par. Those are juvenile steelhead, and they're actually trying to eat the eggs. Uh, so we've got one of them here that is trying to mate. A very little guy, again, you know, uh, that fish is probably six inches, and this male is probably 18 inches. So these are the strategies that these different fish uh, have evolved. And this is the way that jack salmon mate with larger females. This is the way that, you know, uh, a forked horn or a spike buck uh, or bull gets to mate with, you know, preferred females. Um, this is the way is that non-dominant males use kind of sneaky, subversive behavior uh, to find a way to get their sperm uh, into the next generation. Now, ultimately, uh, this is what I like to show is that sometimes it's not just about mating. So here's a slow still. You will see the female is in. They all open their mouths to release their sperm. And this is kind of what I call instant diversity, right? You've got one, two, three, four, again, five males. Uh, but what you see here is the fish that comes alongside over here to the left of the big male. This one here, there's a smaller one. As soon as he's done, you'll notice that he actually sticks his head down into the nest and eats a couple of eggs. So this is not uncommon either, is that some of these smaller males will go in, they will release their sperm, and then they will also um, grab a couple eggs for a snack. So they kind of get the best of both worlds. Now, um, again, uh, this is a, a female steelhead that uh, I filmed in the Elwha River one year after dam, uh, into dam removal. So um, the dams were not yet out, but we relocated adult steelhead up to a few creeks to give a jump start on recolonization so that we knew that we would have smolts coming out when the dams were deconstructed. And um, this female went about two miles up a creek and she ran into a very small little male rainbow trout. You can see him right over here on the right hand side of her shuddering alongside her. And that's the behavior that the males use that shuddering is a way uh, to try and stimulate the female and the female uses his ability to basically shudder to evaluate uh, his physical capacity. So I couldn't help but laugh the day that I saw this because I don't think that little trout ever knew that these large fish existed in the world. And I can't imagine uh, how happy he felt to see uh, a female steelhead that that was that large. Uh, so at the end of the day for all this, it's rainbow trout and small steelhead are really important to steelhead. I mean, resident rainbow trout, you might not think about it, but they can sire up to 20 to 50% of a steelhead population in any given year. So little male rainbow trout, um, we have to take care of those fish too. Uh, but resident females can also produce offspring. So resident rainbow trout um, are also producing eggs and some of those eggs will go off to become steelhead. And because of all these interactions between the life histories, we know that about 20 to 40% of steelhead genes are derived from resident rainbow trout. So I think, you know, kind of my, my take home message there is that don't underestimate uh, the value of smaller fish. Uh, smaller fish are very important and it's kind of like not judging a book by its cover. In this case, uh, rainbow trout, small males, all very important because they provide genetic diversity and life history diversity that the population wouldn't otherwise have. And I think this is the last slide before I go on to the Elwha. So if somebody wanted to, um, if anybody had a question, I could, I could answer that now. Yeah. Uh, and just a reminder, if anyone does have any questions, you do have the ability to ask those through your go-to webinar control panel. There's a little questions tab. Um, so John will pause a couple times and get those answered. Uh, we do have a couple questions, John. I'll save one of them till the end. It might be a little more long-winded, uh, but there's okay. two other ones here from Shandy Danford. Hopefully I didn't pronounce your name incorrectly. Uh, the first question is, can you explain the half-pounder concept? Why are they more prevalent in Southern Oregon rivers? Yeah, hi Shani, that's awesome. Um, hope you're doing well, and I love your Instagram post. She's 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 awesome. There's so many awesome people that I've met on social media. Um, so shout out to her. This is a great question. So she asked a question about there. So there's this what we call a half pounder life history in steelhead, and that life history is basically a juvenile steelhead par that goes out to the ocean, 
spends about two months in the ocean and then returns to fresh water, when it comes back, it's not mature, it's immature. It will overwinter in fresh water and then the next spring, it will go back out to the ocean and spend one or two years at sea. And so um, I'm gonna be frank, we're not exactly sure why those fish are most common in the southern part of the Steelhead's range. But the, as, as Shanti mentioned, they seem to be most common around uh, places from like um, the Eel River, Russian River, north up to about um, the Klamath and Rogue. So there's about a 250 mile stretch of north coast where those fish seem to predominate. And I don't know why it happens, but one reason it could happen is that um, all those rivers also have large populations of summer and fall Chinook. And so uh, summer Chinook tend to spawn about right when those fish are coming back to fresh water. So it could be that it's a strategy for those fish to return to fresh water, uh, consume a bunch of eggs rather than taking a full migration. And the benefit would be that the second time you go out to sea, you're such a large size, you're gonna survive at a much higher rate. So it's probably something about trade-offs between growing larger as a smolt and the survival challenges of just becoming a smolt at six or seven inches. Um, we actually do have half pounders here in the Elwha and we see a few in Puget Sound. So it may have been historically that they were more common in other places and somehow we've eliminated them, but we're starting to see them show up in uh, the Elwha too. And that's interesting because the Elwha has a large population, a uh, large population of summer Chinook. So I think they're probably coming back to take advantage of a winter fall food source and then head out back again in the spring when they grow from that food source. Her uh, second question is, is the river estuary the Danny DeVito? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, I mean, these fish, you know, and that's what I like to point out. I mean, to me, it's like, I think often we look to sports and athletes and these big and they're strong and they're, they're physical peak fitness. And there are steelhead that are like that, but yeah, these Danny, I mean, I call them Danny DeVitos. And the interesting thing to me is, you know, it's, it's just that the size is not as important to the males as it is the females. And that males have this genetic flexibility um, more so than females do. And, I've been working on this for about 20 years. And one reason I like to hit on it is because when I started working on it 20 years ago, people often killed the small steelhead. You know, they didn't really care about them, right? They thought they were kind of a nuisance. There was no management scheme that really accounted for them. And at the time, nobody was trying to manage rainbow trout as though they were a part of the steelhead population. So sorry for a little ramble there, but yeah, those Dannys definitely go out. I mean, Danny can, to me, it's a Danny, and I kind of call them all Dannys, but the Danny DeVito could be a rainbow trout or it could be an estuary fish. I call them those fish that are like 10 to 16 inches in length. Next question here from Derek Miller. Why are steelhead populations much lower than the average population of more vol 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 volatile species like pink and chum? Sorry for the slip up a word there no it's a great question so one of the things we see is there's a larger pattern to this which is uh rainbow trout and cutthroat are two of the oldest pacific salmon species we have along with cherry salmon or masu salmon over on um, the east side of the pacific um, bull trout whitefish are all really ancient species of salmonid and what we see in the ancient species is um, they're not really abundant and they don't achieve the same huge sizes as more recent species uh, and they tend to have uh, more diversity and it seems to be that these are just different strategies on a continuum at one end of the continuum continuum you have fish like bull trout or steelhead that do a lot of different things to reach maturity but because they spread their eggs across so many different baskets um, it's like a stock portfolio, even if you get a really good return on one of those um, and the other ones don't. So there's just less impact of any one or two life histories on that overall portfolio. So pink or chum, on the other hand, um, they have one thing and they do it really well. So if pink salmon hit the open ocean 
and the food conditions are really good for them, they produce so many offspring that even a one or 2% ocean survival is going to result in a return that's really large. And so, you know, it's kind of like abundance begets abundance. That's just their strategy, right? Evolutionarily, they've chosen to, as individuals, um, go out with a really fixed life history. And the challenge, though, is that that's a really risky life history. And so I think the fewer life histories you have, the riskier and more volatile uh, the returns tend to be. And the more life histories you have, the less risky, less volatile. But ultimately, those big swings in productivity for pink and chum are driven by the ocean conditions generally. So if you hit a really good ocean year and uh, those millions of little babies get a lot of food, they're going to generally produce lots of adults the next year. Um, does that answer it? I'm sorry if I maybe didn't get it. We'll wait to hear if that answers the question. Um, next question here from Jenny O'Brien. Hey, John, can you help me understand what is meant by the A run or B run? Is that the same as a one or two saltfish? That's a great question. No, it is not. So traditionally, once the dams were put into the Columbia River Basin, we noticed that there were, and they've known longer for a much longer period than before the dam was in a Bonneville, but people in Idaho noticed there were two kind of different temporal components to the steelhead populations. There were these smaller fish, one salt fish that entered earlier and tended to go a lot of different places in the watershed. And then you had this other older, larger component that entered much later in the season, right? Often returning to those watersheds in September and October, um, some years even later. And those those fish were going to very discrete places, upper clear water in some cases. I can't remember all the watersheds. Um, so the difference is, is that those fish got kind of artificially lumped into two boxes, an A run and a B run. And really the only difference is, uh, biologically, is there was a recent paper by Tim Copeland and IDF and G that showed that there's more overlap between A and B run than we would think. They're not these discrete boxes. But the general assumption kind of still holds that A run fish tend to be one salt younger, smaller, more abundant, and the, the B run enter later at a larger size. And those two different runs are also spatially separated to some degree, right? The B runs tend to go to slightly different places than the A run fish. We have another question here from one of our very own, Bill Pfeiffer. We see the rainbow trout exhibiting similar life histories even when they can't access the ocean. Do you think that's one of the reasons they have been so successful as introduced species? Oh, that's a great point, Bill. I think you're right. Absolutely. I mean, we we actually, so because they do have all these options that when you plant them, they don't even have to go to the ocean to be successful, right? They can live in fresh water. And as Bill said, we see the exact same patterns in freshwater. For example, when you look at um, rivers that have large lake systems, um, and I'm not as familiar with the cutthroat data, but I bet it would be similar, which is in large lake systems, you, the females, the female rainbow trout are more likely to migrate to the lake to take advantage of that richer food source than the males are. And so it kind of goes back to anadromy. Females in general, uh, and salmonids are more likely to migrate to take advantage of richer food sources so they can grow more eggs um, than other fish. But I think you're exactly right. I think that's why they adapt so easily. And they're also very physiologically, I mean, physiologically, micas are flexible. So we talk about them needing cold water. Uh, but I think anybody who's lived in Montana knows, and I, I used to live in Clinton, Montana, there at the, by the Schwartz Creek boat launch for almost two years. And there's a lot of warm water in Montana and rainbow trout are very thermally tolerant. So they can withstand much warmer water temperatures um, than say generally most of the cutthroat subspecies or a brook trout. Um, you know, they're kind of like a brown trout that way. Another question here from Derek Miller. Does an egg fertilized by a Danny offspring make a smaller steelhead? Ah, uh, it's a great question. So it is an interaction between uh, environment and genetics so not always and um, I, I always like to bring up the research on psychopaths for this 
And there's a lot of uh, psychological work that shows that, you know, they can identify the brain patterns of people who would have the genetic predisposition to be a psychopath, but not all of them act on it. So it's kind of like that is that generally, yeah, they're probably more likely, but the females also have a say in this uh, because their genes matter too. And so it, it matters how they get recombined. Um, but we do know that it's not always the case. So, uh, but the probability of that fish returning as a smaller male is higher uh, than it would be a larger male. We can say there's a couple more, but we'll save them for the end. Okay. Okay, great. I'll, I'll, I'll hit on the Elwha River here. So um, I've been on the Elwha since, uh, boy, best 2009, which was um, a couple of years before the dam removal. And the first thing I want to talk about here is that there are a load of partners that, that do this research in the Elwha. I am like one small ant in this big village of scientists. And so I want to thank USGS, you know, um, Bureau Rec, NOAA, NIMS, uh, Lower Clallam Tribe. I mean, I love the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe, WFW, Peninsula College, Olympic National Park, Fish and Wildlife Service, and then a colleague, Keith Denton and Associates, and, and Tom Quinn at UW. This has been a real um, large effort with a lot of people. So I just wanted to acknowledge those folks. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Elwha, uh, this is a map. And so, uh, you know, formerly there were two really large dams on the Elwha. The Elwha Dam, located at River Mile 5, and Glines Canyon Dam at River Mile 13. Neither of those two dams could a fish get by going upstream, but fish could get spilled down through and over the dams at times during high water events, uh, smolts, stuff like that, or resident rainbow trout. And so basically that Elwha Dam blocked 90% of the anadromous habitat, and it reduced the populations of anadromous salmon and steelhead by about 98%, so almost a wholesale loss of those fish. Of course, we were fortunate, for those of you who aren't aware, that the Elwha above those dams had large populations of resident rainbow trout, uh, there were also some bull trout and some coastal cutthroat and some kokanee salmon. Um, but just to show you, you know, that's a lot of habitat that was being blocked by those dams. And so uh, the Elwha dam removal uh, was completed around, uh, uh, removal of the Elwha dam was completed in 2013. And this is a photo of it before. Um, you can see how much sediment was holding behind it, like almost an Empire State Building tall by an Olympic track, you know, in, in circumference and area. So, uh, and most of that, of course, was silt and clay, along with some sand and gravel. Uh, and this is what it looked like deconstructed at the end of 2012 to uh, beginning of 2013. Looks like a, a new place. And then we had Glines Danny, which is a much taller dam that created Lake Mills. And you can see how much taller it was than the Empire State Building down there. And that dam was fully removed in uh, 2014, but it was only passable around 2000, late 2015, early 2016, because there was rock fall that fell into the dam, uh, into the river below the dam site. So that made it impossible for some fish to get through. So that's an important distinction. Remember that 2015 to 16 timeline. I'm going to bring it up again. Uh, but this is an example of, of how much the river changed. And so what you see in September 2011, a photo on the left, that's what it looked like uh, before the dams came out, right? Uh, the dams blocked uh, the sediment that was transported downstream that coarsened the substrate, made it very large, very little sand or spawning gravel. April 2012, um, that's right after. Uh, the dam was first breached. You can see a tremendous amount of silt, of course. Uh, then only a few months later, though, after spring high flows, we're again seeing a re-coarsening of that bed material. Uh, not as coarse as it was prior to dam removal, but you see we've got more pebble and gravel uh, in there, more spawnable stuff in some places. So it was a pretty dramatic but rapid change. And here are a couple photos. This is the uh, former reservoir behind the Elwha dam site during a rainstorm. And so you can see this was just basically a moonscape that was, with each rainstorm dumping in uh, tremendous amounts of sediment. Of course, this is what happened when it when it got dried up in the summer. You know, it looked a little bit like the Sahara Desert. 
And uh, it was not easy for salmon and steelhead to survive during that period immediately after dam removal when the dams were coming out. Um, this is mortality of hatchery chinook smolts that were released two days before one of the biggest flow events we had on record. And it's estimated that we could have lost as many as 30 or 40 percent of those smolts. The interesting thing is those smolts didn't simply die by getting their lung or their gills clogged with sediment. What, what happened is that most of them went to the channel margins and tried to get the off-channel habitat to survive, kind of like this adult steelhead is doing. They tried to get it to clear water. When they couldn't find it and the river receded, they were stranded and they ended up dewatered here all over these big uh, mud flats. Of course, I'm here today to talk again about steelhead. So this is, this is during dam removal, things were very tough and immediately following things were tough. And what steelhead were doing though, was they were finding clear water refugia. So you can see how murky the Elwha is there. And then what we have is a small tributary that comes into a side channel of the Elwha that provided a little bit of clean water. And there, that's where a lot of these steelhead were spawning. So they were kind of concentrating and aggregating into these different places. So when we talk about recolonizing above the dams, um, we did this a number of ways. In 2000, so there is a hatchery program on the Elwha um, that is using wild steelhead for broodstock. So some of those fish started to return in 2012. In 2010, 11, and 12, um, in 2015, and then 2016, and I think five years, we would catch steelhead and fish traps in the lower river where they were swimming into smolt traps and clear water areas. And we would take those fish and then transport them in a fish truck to the two tributaries to the upper Elwha. And these were tributaries that were not influenced by dam removal. And we put radio tags on some of these fish. And so that helped kind of jumpstart recolonization. Uh, but once the dams were out in 2012 and 2015, we also started to see natural recolonization at that point um, in 2018 we basically stopped trucking any more steelhead to the upper above the dams and, and things that are happening now up there are completely natural and so to determine the extent and rate of recolonization we use red counts and and snorkel surveys in the creeks and then we've also used radio telemetry uh, and this is just a photograph of two of the steelhead that were released into one of the creeks and those are the radio tags that are on their back so here is just a uh, map showing uh, extent of recolonization, kind of a timeline moving uh, left to right for how far steelhead have been documented up in the watershed. So you see there's been a dramatic increase over the past eight years in how far steelhead have penetrated the watershed. And now we're basically at the point where we're seeing steelhead up to almost the full anadromous barriers in the very uppermost reaches of the Elwha River. So you think about that, these dams have only been out for, a, and, and the fish have only had, again, this is where this 2016-15 date comes in, those steelhead colonizing the upper basin above blinds have only had about three to four years to do that. So it's really exciting to see this really rapid colonization of that upper watershed. So, uh, the Elwha is full of sediment during all of those times, uh, during those periods of time when the dams were being removed and then after they were removed. And so to count fish during those periods, we use sonar, uh, much like they do in Alaska. And we have three sonar units in the Elwha, two of which are used in the lower river. And so what you can see here in this is you've got uh, the number of steelhead uh, that we counted based on reds and sonar in 2010 and then again in 2013 and then you see the the steelhead numbers kind of going up each year and so you can see we had a and we don't have the the year prior to dam removal on here we had about 150 to 200 wild winter steelhead in the elwha before dam removal we're now up into that 1500 to 1600 fish range and what is interesting is that over the past four to five years Initially, about 70% of that was broodstock fish, the hatchery impact, uh, or hatchery fish surviving and coming back. But in the last couple of years, we've seen that shift to be about 50 to 60, maybe 70% wild fish. So the wild fish are starting to take off 
Um, the broodstock population likely help provide some intervals, individuals to jumpstart that. So it's just exciting again to see a population go from close to extinction now up to about 16, 1700 fish. Um, and these are estimates here uh, from a smolt trap in the Elwha River that showed the number of smolts that were being produced. And uh, you can see the little arrows down here, 2012 and 15. And that tells you when the dams were taken out. And you can see we've basically gotten a really big responses in steelhead smolt production since the second dam, Glines Canyon, came out. And I should also caution people that these smolt estimates are likely low. Smolt traps are not very efficient for fish the size of steelhead smolts. They can pretty easily swim and avoid the trap. So these are probably minimum estimates. But in any case, the point is, is that Juveniles and adults are increasing for um, steelhead in the Elwha River. Um, last but not least, I think most exciting is that summer steelhead were almost extirpated. That life history was almost extirpated in the Elwha prior to dam removal. Um, in, in the three years I was snorkeling the Elwha, the lower five miles below the dam, before the dams were removed, I, I never saw more than two summer steelhead in any given year. And uh, usually one of those fish was a clipped fish, probably returned from another hatchery somewhere else. Uh, so, but scientists before us were acutely aware that there were uh, the potential for summer steelhead in the upper Elwha because there were piles of rainbow trout up there. But there's also this record. So here's a picture of Eleanor Chittenden in 1907 with about a 12 pound summer run that she caught on a fly rod in the upper Elwha. And so summer steelhead were formerly pretty common in the upper Elwha. And this is a photograph uh, in a creek in 2012. It was the first documented summer steelhead uh, above the Elwha Dam site. And so that's always exciting. And so we've been working with the Olympic National Park and the Lower Elwha Tribe and National Meat Fisheries Service to conduct snorkel surveys in the upper Elwha. And it's not easy to get up there. It's a 20 mile hike to get into the upper Elwha. It's that remote. And then once you're up there, we have to snorkel about 35 miles a river, and that requires day hikes of anywhere from four to 10 miles round trip. So it's a lot of work to get up there. And these are the raw snorkel counts uh, for different places in the upper watershed. And what I can say is that the length of stream sampled in 2018 and 19 was equal. In 2016 and 17, we sampled very short reaches. So 2016 and 17, um, by 2017, I think we counted 89 adult summer steelhead uh, in about 15 miles of river. In 2018, we covered the 35 miles of the upper basin and counted 230. And then in 2019, we repeated that, covered again the 35 miles, and we found uh, uh, 341 steelhead. So any of you in Montana right now thinking about this, I mean, we're basically four years out from removing that one dam, and we went from zero adult summer steelhead to 340. But let's be clear, we don't get the sample, we can't snorkel the entire Elwha. There's a five mile canyon called the Grand Canyon that is class three whitewater. So far, it's been considered unsnorkelable. We're not allowed to really go in and try and snorkel it. There's also a couple other short canyons. So we don't get to sample those areas. And also as a snorkeler, when you're going through a river, just like anybody, I can't count all the fish. The Elwha is large enough in these canyons that there are very large boulders and huge plunge pools. There's plenty of places for adult steelhead to hide that we can't see. So we needed to understand what the 340 fish meant that we counted. So to do that, we used a, a mark recite technique. And what we did was we captured fish, adult steelhead and sains, and then we tagged them with floy tags, which are tags about three inches long that we put on their back. And then we know the number of steelhead that we tagged. We know the number of steelhead that we observed and counted. And using those three numbers, we can estimate what the 340 fish actually equated to. And so using that model, we can see that the Mark Recite estimate for the total abundance of wild summer steelhead in the Elwha is about 920 uh, to 997 wild summer steelhead. So in 2019, that means that the Elwha, four, four years after dam removal, got back more wild steelhead than the Clearwater got back wild B-run steelhead in Idaho. 
It also means that the Elwha likely outproduced combined all the other summer steelhead streams on the whole Olympic Peninsula. And this is most likely, if not entirely, much larger than any other single summer run population of steelhead that we have uh, on the Washington coast. So this has been a, a shocking result uh, for these fish to come back uh, at that level. And I think I can stop here and then we can ask if a couple other questions and I could bring up my other, uh, my other talk. Yeah, we have a we have one question here from Terry. I apologize if I totally butcher your last name. I think it's uh, Minor Shagan. Um, you mentioned not trekking steelhead upstream, and that upper river is quote unquote natural. How does this relate to the hatcheries? And then a follow up question to that would be what what species are in the hatcheries? That's a great question. So. We're released, uh, the tribe releases hatchery smolt for winter steelhead and for coho salmon, and the state releases hatchery chinook, but there are no hatchery releases for summer steelhead. So uh, <clears throat> we've, we've done the preliminary genetic work that indicates that, or strongly suggests that most of those steelhead coming out of the upper, that are returning to the upper Elwha came from rainbow trout that were in the upper Elwha. Um, but that's a good question. So. Um, most of the winter steelhead that we see are below the Grand Canyon, which is River Mile, I think, 22. And then above Grand Canyon, it appears to be mostly summer steelhead. So it looks like there is a kind of a demarcation line in the Elwha, below which is, is you know, uh, winter steelhead, above which is summer runs. Um, and the summer runs at this point, you know, wild while the winter, can, while the winter run is a, a mixture of both hatchery and wild. That's all the questions we have right at the moment. Sure. Okay. Well, I think we can go over we can go over some fun fishing stuff. Uh, so I don't know how much um, I didn't know how much the individuals here, how much experience everyone has um, fishing for steelhead. And of course, I'm going to talk about fly fishing. I do gear fish at times, but look, 99% of the time, I'm I'm casting a spay rod or fishing a single-handed rod. So I mostly fly fish. So I want to kind of talk about four things to consider, and I called it kind of a, a primer on steelhead. And, and the first thing I notice is that when you introduce, even, even experienced anglers, it's really, I think the most difficult thing for a, a, a young angler, an inexperienced angler, is to choose the right water. I mean, a river's a really large place, and there's a lot of places fish that sit. And, you know, species like coho salmon tend to like pools and slow water, while species like steelhead tend to like more swift water with more current, larger boulders. So there are differences between species. But if you're, if you're fly fishing for steelhead, I think I prefer that traditional water that's about three to eight feet deep. And when you're talking about the current speed, it can vary. I mean, I catch steelhead in everything from really slow moving water that is almost stagnant where I have to strip the fly every now and then to really fast water where it's impossible for the fly to get below the, the surface. It just skates on top. But generally, most steelhead, um, I find, not most steelhead, what I find is that my success fishing for steelhead is highest as a fly angler fishing uh, current that looks about walking speed, right? So if you look at the river and then you start walking along the river bank and you're moving, you know, what I like to do what I initially did early on is I just throw a leaf or something else in the water and see how fast it moved downstream. And if I can keep pace with that at a normal walk, then I felt really comfortable fishing that. And so those are, you know, I like to think about depth and current speed. Those are two really critical components because steelhead are very fusiform in body shape. And so they've evolved to take advantage of faster currents uh, than most species of salmon have. And along with that, in what comes with fast water, because the faster the water is, the more ability it has to transport sediment. So fast current usually has bigger rocks in it. So steelhead love boulders and lots of them. I mean, um, they're steelhead homes. And then I also think that most traditional steelhead fishing is done through kind of long runs where people kind of work through it a step at a time. But I'd also remind people, don't just focus on the most commonly fished areas. There are lots of what we call fish traps 
or pockets, little places that fish will hang out for an hour to three hours, four hours for a short period of time before moving on their way. Um, places that they, they might seek a respite, you know, for a little bit of time. So you've always got those normal standard runs, again, three to eight feet deep, that medium speed current with lots of boulders, but just don't, don't always, you know, pass up the stuff that's in between because that stuff that's in between is less fish, even though it might have less fish in it because it's less fish by other anglers. Uh, sometimes I can pick fish out of those places. And so I always like to show a, a picture of kind of what I think is kind of the perfect swing water. And this is the mouth of the Dean River, right where it drops into the ocean. And this is just one of those runs that's got, you know, the inside seam is really soft, slow walking speed water. It's about three to eight feet deep and it's just kind of that classic but when i'm looking for steelhead water i'm looking for basketball size rock i'm not looking for you know tennis balls i'm not screwing around with golf balls you know you want you want big boulders um the second factor isn't just the structure of the home that they prefer it's also water temperature and i live in a place where it's mostly winter steelhead fishing but i was kind of you know raised doing lots of summer steelhead um, steelhead are basically physiologically optimized. They've evolved to be a peak performance around 50 to 65 degrees. When temperatures fall outside of that range, and the longer they're outside of that range, the fish become less responsive. So, of course, this gets into, look, during the summer season, steelhead are often in that kind of thermal wheelhouse where they're at their physiological prime and they can, you know, do a lot of different things. They, they're more aggressive. Uh, they can expend more energy in a fight. Um, and of course, as those temperatures drop below 50 degrees, which is common in winter, on the Olympic Peninsula where I live, the most common temperatures in winter are about 41 to 42 degrees. Once the temperatures get that cold, the fish become more lethargic. They're less aggressive. They don't fight as hard. And so um, I just go back to, I think Mark hit on this earlier. Look, when I'm in summer, I use a dry line all the time. I do not use sink tips in summer. I like, um, I often fish surface flies the vast majority of time uh, because I like that surface action. And so in the summer, because the fish are more active and have more energy, you can also fish faster uh, water than you would in the winter because those fish are gonna be hanging in it and they have plenty of energy. So a lot of times, you know, what I'm doing in summer is I'm fishing that same water, but then I'm also hitting that faster and shallower stuff when they're more active. In the winter, in contrast, uh, rather than, you know, focusing some of my energy on faster and shallower, I go to slower and deeper where they're more lethargic. So just paying attention to water temperature and the activity level of fish is really important because I've seen people in the summer go into slower and deeper places and try and dead drift fish out. And that'll work. Uh, to me, it's just not as fun. I'd rather go up into that faster, shallower stuff where the steelhead's going to grab it and turn and run. Uh, and so just again, you know, steelhead are really aggressive when they're in their wheelhouse. And if you can find them in those temperatures, um, there's really, again, no reason to need to go to a sink tip um, or anything else, right? They should be plenty aggressive. So uh, to me, water color or visibility and behavior are really important. And I know that uh, places like the Clearwater in the summer and fall, that's not always a huge issue. Um, but I also know that people fish a lot of other places. Of course, I'm sure you folks go to other places to fish. For me, for winter run steelhead, and I'm gonna to get to summers here, winter run steelhead tend to be most active when the flows are dropping. So you've just had this big shot of rain and I find summer steelhead are, are that way too, but summer steelhead may be less so after they've been in the system for a long time. They kind of get used to short brief rainstorms, but for winter runs and, and, and uh, spring steelhead, I find that you get those nice big flows, fresh fish come in the river on those freshets, and so they tend to be really aggressive. But the other thing is that when flows, when, when, the, when the flows go up, say in a river like the Hoe, the flows might go up from 2,000 to 20,000 CFS. When they raise that much, the water temperature increases by about three to five degrees. So another important thing is that when the flows are dropping, the, the temperatures are dropping, but they had been warmer. So that warmer temperature during the higher flows makes them active. But when the flows get stable for a long period, I think the fish become less active. They become more acclimated to our environment. I like to think of this as, you know, just being kind of bored in school. You've basically looked at all the things that are possible in your little neighborhood. You've been living behind that same rock for a month or two. 
you're just reluctant to leave it. Uh, and I also think, you know, when you think of behavior that uh, morning and evenings are really important for all animals, those crepuscular hours, you know, and what I see in steelhead is that during morning and evening, uh, steelhead tend to move up into shallow water areas that you will not find them in during the rest of the day when the sun is right on the water, if it's a sunny day, or even if it's just cloudy, that they take advantage of low light conditions to use shallow water. So again, in mornings and evenings, I start to focus on shallower water while I'm often fishing slightly deeper water during the middle of the day. And that's not always, I mean, you've got to know your river, um, but that's just something to think about is that the behavior of the fish and the water conditions and the time of day all matter. And I go back to optimal visibility for steelhead is not eight feet. You can see every fish in the river. It's about three to five feet. And it's kind of that steelhead green, like you see in the lower right-hand picture there. And I find this universally true for winter or summer steelhead. If you get a little bit of color in the water, I think the fish feel much safer. And that makes them more reactive. But it's also because when the visibility goes down, it's usually that the stream flow is increasing. And when the stream flow increases, as I mentioned earlier, the water temperatures also increase, which allow the fish to be more active. And, uh, but if you're a winter steelheader, um, the best fishing is going to come when the visibility is low. And if you like to target, you know, larger fish, um, most of those larger fish that I get are caught during those low visibility periods when there's one to three feet of visibility in the river. So the last thing is kind of what we do as humans. I, you know, I've, I've looked at kind of the physical structure that steelhead like. They like these shallow three to eight foot deep riffles, lots of boulders, walking speed. Uh, water temperature matters a lot, as does the visibility and stream flow. But one thing, again, that's important is you've got to edit a lot of water because as a steelheader, you've got to kind of learn over time which places hold fish because the rough model that I gave you there's a lot of runs in every river that are three to eight feet deep that have boulders in them, right? And so some of those, for some reason or other, that you'll probably pick up on if you spend enough time on that river, some of those places will hold more fish. So you've got to learn to edit the water. And what I like to say by that is don't move too slow. Uh, many, many uh, newcoming steelhead anglers, spay fishermen that I see that swing the fly, they move way too slow to a run for my for my like, I, I take one cast and then I take two big steps, sometimes three. Uh, the steelhead, once the visibility gets to be about four to five feet at a minimum, the steelhead can see your fly from about 10 to 15 feet away. So they can see a lot better than we can underwater. So keep moving, um, that's important. But always, I mean, my presentation is really, you've got to tailor your approach to those conditions and, you know, uh, it's why in winter I tend to use uh, wet flies and sink tips because flows are higher and the temps are colder. I need to get my fly down there to the fish. But that said, there are also periods in the winter when the stream flows are really low and the water gets really clear. And those tend to coincide with our coldest periods, you know, when you get those long freezes. And in those periods, I will sometimes just go away completely from a sink tip and go to my summer stuff because there's no longer a need for a sink tip. Uh, and dry line, summer and fall, you know, once you're in those water temperatures, if you're taking a temperature every day like I do, and that temperature is over 50, um, you know, a dry line is all you need. And uh, a couple of other issues that I personally prefer. So uh, I love to set the hook on steelhead. There's debates over, should I set the hook? Should I not? I did a podcast on this on my podcast, an episode on it where I talked about, should you set the hook or not? And so I think my podcast is called, oh, geez, it's on the Barbless Network. It's OP Fishing on Barbless Company. My data suggests that you're way better off setting the hook on a steelhead than you, than, than you are if you don't set a hook. Your landing rate should go up. That said, in summer, the fish are sometimes so aggressive, there's no need to set a hook. If a fish takes my fly and immediately turns with it like a really aggressive trout, I'm not going to set the hook. That's good enough. But if that fish doesn't turn really hard, universally, I'm going to set the hook hard. And I'm going to move my rod to the inside bank when I set the hook. The other thing is, um, with the advent of spay rods, so I started spay casting in the late 90s. And sometime in the early two, sometime in the mid to late 2000s, the rod size started shrinking. And now a lot of these rods are switch rods. or 11 feet, 12 feet, 13 feet long. 
I tend to cast 13 and a half to 14 and a half foot rods because I like to cast long distances. I always fish the inside seam. But the other thing I would say is people are, people, people mention to me is that, you know, most of those steelhead sit on the inside seam. As somebody who snorkel a lot, that's not true. You know, there's steelhead throughout the run. So don't think that casting long distances aren't going to be an important component in your toolbox because when you're standing there in the water, if you can get an extra 10 feet of line out to a place, that might make the difference between a grab and a day and no grab. Uh, and I always like just to remind people, surface flies are my favorite means of steelheading altogether, and that's the best in summer. And so just again, thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your night, and I appreciate it. Just a couple more questions here. Um, Tony Kate wants to know... Um, when do you first see fishing on the Elwha? How do you see Washington National FWP and Native collaborating on an acceptable solution to recreation? That's a good question. I don't know when the Elwha is going to open. Um, each species is going to be treated differently. So we have criteria for all the different species that we need each species to meet before we open. Um, my hunch is the first species will be a hatchery coho fishery because they're having a surplus of hatchery coho that fishery could eventually result in you know you don't need the hatchery anymore but for steelhead i still think you know five six years down the road and i think it's going to be a very conservative fishery the tribe we're working very closely with the elwha tribe i think they want to they want a lot of the same things we do um so we've got to make sure that we don't do to the elwha what we have done to all our other watersheds, right? This is a chance to get it right. And the Elwha is about the only place uh, any person can take their child right now and say, in 20 years, you're going to have better fishing here than I ever had in my life. And, you know, I think, as I've mentioned to my friends and, and colleagues, is that that's really rare because almost all of us who are anglers grew up hearing from their dad and grandfather who were born a generation too late. You miss the good stuff. And that's not the case in the Elwha. Another question here from Jake Van Nopen. John, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all your work and what you and your dad have done for us in Steelhead. I also consider the Deschutes my home waters and started fishing it in the late 80s with my dad. As you know, it's a special place. I was hoping to hear your comments on the Washington Fish and Game webinar on their proposed rule changes. It looks like they went with option three, and I was wondering if you thought this was enough to help meet the escapement goal they have set. Do you think we need to do more? Great question, and thank you very much for that compliment. You know, I love these fish, and uh, my dad did too, and, and so did my grandfather, and I feel like, you know, it's in our blood um, to try and do what we can to ensure the next generation has fish, and I, I love the shoots too. I mean, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, for me, it was it was the river that nurtured me as a young boy, you know, growing up and learning how to become a trout fisherman. I um, I think option three. Yeah, we've been we've been deeply involved, as people probably know. So on the Olympic Peninsula this year, you know, the last year was a very poor run. We're expected to have very poor returns on the OP for the next four to five years. Um, we've been working hard for the six years I've been here, but uh, you know, me as a, me personally, I've lived up here 25 years now and I've been working on this for about 17, 18 years, reminding anglers that, you know, look, these run trajectories don't look good. We're having really high harvest levels and the fish that aren't being harvested are being caught and released one and a half to two times. And that's a, a bad combination in this day and age, especially when we're going through climate change. So, our, my take and our take it to you is that option three was the right choice. The best option is to have people not fish from their boats. You can use your boat as transportation, but you're not allowed to fish from it. And the reason is that the catch per unit effort when fishing out of a boat for steelhead on the OP is five to 20 times higher than you would have for, or <clears throat> three to five, <clears throat> three to five times <clears throat> higher you have for boats, but it's like five to 20 times higher if it's a guided boat. So. The issue was that we were ending up basically touching all the fish more than one time on average that made it through the fishery in some of those rivers. And with the steep decline, we think that 
while we're really happy the department took this action to implement regulations that we think allow us to kind of fish conservatively, and it will have a measurable effect moving forward, we also believe that we're going to have to work long term on escapement goals, fisheries, and hatcheries. And that's what we're working on right now. We've got a historic abundance paper on steelhead that should be published in about five to six months. <clears throat> we also have a life cycle model that we're working on with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. We've invited uh, tribal co-managers to participate, and I'm working on that with Matt Sloat, who's a scientist at the Wild Salmon Center, and NIMS folks. So we're trying to bring everybody to the table. A lot of this doesn't make it to the press because, you know, you just do the work behind the scenes until you end up with, with something you can share. Um, but my point is, I guess you're right. We're thinking long term, and we're going to have a blog post coming out on that early next week. And just to let folks know that, you know, every day that basically I live up here, we're in contact with folks. We're trying to use some new science to figure out a way to better manage these fish. And we think that we're on the right path. Um, we just hope, again, it's not a little too late. But uh, I think that we applaud the department for making this tough choice. It's hard on those guides that felt they could only fish out of a boat. Um, it's certainly not easy for them. And I feel, you know, empathetic towards their situation we're also up against the the ninth inning right we're at the precipice we do something now where the fish are going to be ESA listed and then the fisheries close and so those that were reluctant to change um i wish they would change but you know there's other fisheries they can go to right and and those fisheries uh, are probably doing better than ours a couple more questions and then i think we'll We'll defer it over to Mark. Uh, another question from Shandy. Do you see steel, steelies ever returning to SoCal, Baja area, or is that just mythical? It's a great question. I mean, it depends whether humanity can get its shit together, right? I mean, and these animals can live basically anywhere if we cut them their space. Uh, but I'll tell you, the concern that I have is the human population at this point in time is so massive. And uh, the growth rate isn't slowing down fast enough. Like there's no awareness about this, right? It's never discussed politically. And it's a personal choice for lots of people. But the fact is, is it just seems to me that there's probably too many humans on the planet to allow that to happen. And it's sad. Uh, but perhaps there is a way that, you know, we're sitting here. I mean, still had a remarkably resilient. So the important thing is that those headwaters will likely always retain some rainbow trout because there are ancestors of ancient cutthroat slash kind of hybrid rainbow trout that are still in rivers that drain to Mazatlan. So, you know, during the great ice age that we last went through, almost certainly there were steelhead in Mexican rivers, probably all the way down through Central America. So, um, steelhead ebb and flow, right, with climate change and these changes in their environment. I think they have the resilience to live there. It's just whether we give them their space to do so. Okay, last question here. This is a good one to end on. I, I would like to reiterate that a ton of people messaged and said, thank you so much for, for a great presentation. Um, so last question here, what, what are some things we can do here in Montana to help support steelhead recovery? That's a great question. So, um, you know, I would I would say this. You know, we have a, a Wild Steelhead Initiative website called wildsteelheaders.org. And, um, you know, we're on Instagram and Facebook, and I maybe we're on Twitter. I don't have Facebook, but I have Instagram. Facebook is just too, too mean in the fish world. <laughs> so uh, pay attention to our social media and keep abreast of the issues. And if you have a favorite river, feel free to reach out to any of us in the group and ask for more information because, you know, uh, in talking with people over the years, and April Volke and I had this talk several years ago, which is that I thought she said it really well, and I keep repeating that, and I always love to give people credit for, for what I think is a good take. And April said, you know what, choose your favorite river, know it well, and then fight for it. And so that's, that's you know, what I repeat to folks is I live in a place that I love, and I do most of my fighting for this place. But because it is my job, I'm working across all the states that we, we live in. Um, but choose a river if you have a favorite river. 
reach out, learn more about that river, get in contact with the, the biologist that works on that river. And over time, I think it's important to develop relationships and learn more. And then if you see things that you're concerned about, get involved. Um, for us on the OP, I think we're always, there's always going to be opportunities. It's you. We're trying to work right now on a number of, of issues that are going to come up where we likely need support. So please follow us. And if you come out here and fish, you know, treat the fish well and remind people that, you know, you love these steelhead and that you want catch and release and that, you know, we want to have conservative fisheries. I think part of this is we're fighting right now a tradition. The tradition is to close rivers, right? The tradition is to wait till the fishery, the fish population is on the ESA list and close the river. We're trying to say, don't do that. You know, implement more restrictive fisheries before you get to the point of an ESA listing. And so, you know, when these hot and heavy debates are occurring, we could use support from TU chapters probably all over the West, you know, just providing feedback on our social media pages that, we support conservative fisheries as a means to an end for rebuilding steelhead on the OP. Um, but we're not just working, <clears throat> working the OP. So definitely, you know, pay attention to our social media. Um, I think if you all don't have my email, get it from Mark or others or on our website, wildsteelheaders.org, and feel free to reach out to us. Well, John, that was fantastic. I learned so much and uh, just the appreciation that you have for Steelhead and that, you know, many of us do just really, really hit home. Um, what a resilient fish, but what a, what a tough fish, but boy, we're just kind of doing everything we can to make it hard for them. <laughs> but uh, we're doing some good things too. And you asked, you know, what, what we can do here in Montana. Well, one small thing, the West Slope chapter is doing is sending you a check for a thousand dollars, you know, to the That's West Slope Initiative. Yeah. And our other members, um, uh, if they can buy some raffle tickets, that'll help uh, fill our coffers, and more money will go into trout and steel and conservation for sure. But again, thank you well, for, the for the fantastic oh, well, thank uh, you. program. Yeah, thank and you thanks, and everyone. everyone and, you know, joining. Yeah, your region always has a place in my heart. You know, it's a it's a wonderful area, and I love Montana like I love my own home. And um, just thank you for all your chapter does. I mean, I love so many people into you. I I'm proud to be a part of it. So thank you. Great. Thanks, John. And good night. And good night, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye.